to continue our journey of discovery into an absolute treasury that is contained within the book of Mark. Now, you know, we, when we read the scriptures, you can speed read and you get the gist of the lessons, but sometimes when you take time and you just stop and you, and you take a passage of scripture and you look at it and you, and you just meditate on, on what is being said here, it's like these, uh, I guess it's like the, the gems, it's like gems on a, on, a, on, a, on a treasure cave that you find and you, and you just marvel at the beauty of what you're looking at. And, um, you know, I, I am amazed. It never, you know, I mean, I've been a Christian for a long time, but I, I am, I'm amazed at sometimes how stories that we read in the Gospels reflect the heart of God. And, you know, there's so many things that Jesus wanted to teach his disciples. And, and like us, you know, the original disciples were often very slow to learn and they had a hard time grasping what Jesus was saying. But, but by God's grace, they did come to understand. And ultimately, that understanding was laid down as the foundation for the church with Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, the apostles and prophets as the foundation level and the church rising as a place where God is worshipped and we are a part of this wonderful thing that God had in mind. And today, you know, ultimately, uh, Jesus planned it so that you and I here today could hear the same message that was being spoken to the apostles and the disciples back when Jesus walked among us. Today we're going to be looking at the last half of Mark 8, starting with verse 22. Verse 22 reads, They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and he said, I see people and they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes and then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Well, when I first read this, I'm thinking, spit. Ew. You know, maybe that's the reaction that you have when you first hear this. What is this about? This is a very interesting miracle. There's no other mention of this miracle, by the way, in the other Gospels. This is, this is recorded in Mark alone. He's the only one that, John Mark is the only one that makes mention of it. And at the beginning of this story that we just read here in the Gospel, we see Jesus and his disciples coming back to a town that they had visited before. And they came to this town of Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida has significance. Uh, Jesus visited Bethsaida on a number of occasions, and a lot of his ministry was done in and around Bethsaida. And Bethsaida was a small town in Galilee, best known as the birthplace of Jesus, uh, of three of Jesus' disciples, um, Philip, Peter, and Andrew. So we read this about this in John 1, 44 and 45, where it's written, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses spoke about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Well, historically speaking, Jesus did many of his miracles in or around the town of Chorazin and Bethsaida, the towns of. But sadly, for the most part, despite what was done by Jesus in this town, 
Bethsaida was largely a community of unbelievers. In Jesus' own words, in the book of Matthew 11.21, we read this. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. It's written in John chapter 12, verse 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. So the first thing that we see when we look at this particular miracle is there was this man and his friends who had come looking for Jesus in Bethsaida. This man placed his hope in Jesus and came to him. He was totally blind. And when the Lord encountered this blind man, what was his first action when you look at that scripture? His first action was to lead him out of the unbelieving community of Bethsaida. You see, there are great spiritual parallels in this story that would, we would do well to pay attention to. This man was physically blind, but he was also spiritually blind, but hungry. The miracle we have just read about has these significant spiritual lessons and parallels which show us the character and the hand of God and how he relates to his people. Before Jesus heals someone of their spiritual blindness, the first thing that he does is lead them out of the community of skeptics and unbelievers by the hand. See, he... He leads by the hand because a blind man cannot navigate his own way out of the tangle of skepticism and unbelief to faith in Jesus on his own. So God reaches his hand out and leads him away from that place. Because nobody comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ unless God does his handiwork in drawing them. And the good news today, my friends, is that Jesus Christ brings such a personal touch to our encounter with him. He sees us in the state that we are in, and he cares enough that he takes us by the hand and he leads us to a place where he can minister to us. It reminds me of a very famous Christian song, and for the younger people, you probably laugh at me because the song was written by a band called Ocean in 1971. I'm dating myself. Very likely, some of the older people here are familiar with this song. And the lyrics to the chorus of this song are this. Put your hand in the hand of the man who stilled the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself, and you can look at others differently by putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. You guys remember that? Yeah. Okay. What happens next in the performance of this physical miracle is amazing on a number of levels. The physical miracle itself demonstrates the incredible compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ to those who are blind and unable to properly see their way through life. That is great, but after taking the man by the hand and leading him out of the community of unbelievers, we see almost a bizarre kind of action take place where the Lord puts spit into this man's eyes, his spit. He rubs his saliva into this man's eyes. And then he places his hands on him. Now, there's significance to this. There's several miracles in which Jesus uses his spit in the process of healing people. Well, why, Why would Jesus use spit to open the eyes of a blind man? Was there some miraculous healing property or quality in the spit of Jesus at a molecular level? 
that would make his spit different than other people's spit? There's been speculation. I've read some commentaries that are like, oh, there's miracle qualities about spit. And no, 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 no. Okay. If we could bottle the spit that came from Jesus, right, and sell it, or like the Shroud of Turin, or the Holy Grail, would it be a cure for all diseases of the world? Did Jesus have to use his spit in the process of this miracle? The answer is a resounding no. He did not have to use his spit to heal this blind man's eyes. Jesus did miracles of a similar nature without the use of spit. As God in the flesh, Jesus could have just spoken the word and this man would have been healed instantly. See, I don't think the Lord healed this man in this way without having a very good reason for doing it. So it brings us back to the question. Why does God heal people physically in the first place? Is the healing hand of God not put into play to relieve human suffering? Well, certainly. The Lord has compassion on our physical sicknesses and the brokenness of his people. He has compassion on us. And certainly, Jesus was pleased when this blind, blind man came and he was able to restore this blind man's sight. I'm sure he was pleased with that. Undeniably. The ease of suffering was one of the primary reasons why he heals. But does he heal primarily so that we can have a better life here on the earth? I don't think so. I think that Jesus had deeper spiritual reasons for healing people which were meant to teach us spiritual lessons about the eternal plan of God and that this plan transcends the physical reality that we see around us. So what is the spiritual application, the lesson of the Messiah taking his saliva, his spit, and placing it into the blind man's eyes? Now let's look at a deeper spiritual parallel here. Inside every single human being alive is tainting, tainting from the sin of Adam that's been passed down from our forefather and foremother to us. But Adam, the sin of Adam has corrupted the entire human race. In our natural state prior to believing and prior to being rescued by our Savior Jesus, we are given over to the darkness of spiritual death. In our own volition, we are separated from God because we have been spiritually blinded by our own sin and the powers of spiritual darkness that are on the earth. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, we hear this. It's, we're told thus. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Hold that thought. The Apostle John in John chapter 1 verses 10 to 13 further reinforces this thought when he says of Jesus, he was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, children, not, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. And Paul reminds the Ephesians the way that they used to be before intervention was brought to them through the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, it is written, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, 
the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature deserving of wrath. So the miracle of the healing of the blindness of this man in Mark 8 mirrors the work of God in the human spirit when salvation comes to them. This is accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit. In this miracle, Jesus uses his saliva to touch the blind man's eyes. What is actually being said here is that a person's spiritual blindness is taken away when the spiritual DNA of God connects with the spiritual DNA of the fallen man. The result is that darkness is expelled and light comes in. When the spiritual day DNA of God connects with the spiritual DNA of a human being, there is a transformation that takes place. The life-giving power of the shed blood of Jesus makes atonement for the man's sin. The man's disobedience and his spiritual blindness is cured. The Holy Spirit enters into the life of that man or woman, and subsequently he or she is born again in the Spirit. I don't know about you, when I start to think about this, I get excited. I'm excited. When the Holy Spirit of God enters into a person who accepts Jesus as their Savior, the contact of the person of the indwelling Holy Spirit, who is the living God, enters into that, of that person who truly believes in the power of of the Holy Spirit. Once the sin is atoned for, the vessel is clean and is prepared to be a place where God dwells. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, not because of yourselves, not because you're good enough to earn your way to heaven or to earn your way to a relationship with God on your own merit. It is only by the grace of God through the power of the shed blood of Jesus that you have become a child of the living God and have become a cleansed vessel prepared for the Holy Spirit to dwell within. Do you get it? Darkness is expelled in the presence of the light of God. This is the miracle that Jesus was was giving an example for as a precursor to everything that would take place through Calvary and through Acts chapter 2. The power of the Spirit touches spiritually blinded eyes, brings spiritual healing and restoration. You see, the spiritual blindness that we have as sinners does not permit us to see the truth that can set us free. This is why we can't save ourselves. And this is why religion that is self-proclaimed and self-administered is powerless. Because it is only when God touches our spirit that light comes. The unification of the holy presence of the person of God with the spirit of fallen man is only possible through the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way. He's the only way, the truth, the life. This is why he is the savior of the world. Jesus brings new spiritual life and salvation, both from the curse and the penalty of sin and the effects of that sin. And when the Holy Spirit enters the cleansed vessel, Sight is restored. But there's more. This is part of this. There's more. In this miracle, spiritual sight is restored to the blind man in the first instance when when Jesus touched him. But did you notice that the touch of the Lord Jesus in this man, in this miracle, has a progressive element to it? There's an element of progression. There's a reason for Jesus performing this miracle in this way. Yeah, Jesus could have certainly healed this man, we said already, by speaking the, the healing into him. And, and he could have brought this man to perfect clarity immediately. But he was trying to teach us a spiritual lesson. 
There is a progressiveness to our understanding and, and, and seeing clearly the truth of God. When you're first saved, sometimes it's like the light turns on, the darkness is gone, but you're not seeing everything all that clearly. The people might look like trees. It's a little bit fuzzy. You're so grateful that the lights have been turned on. You can see. I can see. But there is this element that there's a little bit of clarity that needs to come. You see, spiritually speaking, we need the touch of the master more than just the time that we get saved to help us bring clarity. We need his ongoing touch upon our eyes to help us see things clearly spiritually. Paul tells us in Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18, now this Lord is in this, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. The veil of sin, my friends, that caused the spiritual blindness has been taken away and we have become partakers in the divine nature. No, it's not like the New Agers say that you become another God. No. Don't listen to that lie. Partaking in the divine nature is not the same as becoming God. Partaking in the divine nature means yielding yourself to God and allowing God to take you. And, God, and you can't do that on your own. It's only as the Spirit draws you. But you see, the compassion of Jesus with this man, leading him out of the captivity to this place where he's ready to, to be healed. And then he touches him and he heals him. And then he touches him again. And the clarity comes more and more. Praise the Lord. This ongoing transformation with ever-increasing glory comes from the Lord and helps us to see the truth of clarity. And what is the result of it all? The result of it all is freedom. You see, it matters very little what happens in the kingdoms of this world because God is in control. Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. And it matters very little about what happens in the kingdoms of this world because nothing happens without God allowing it to. Nothing. And it's all pointing to a plan that he has. Not just a plan for the here and now, but a plan for eternity. So, and on this fact, there was a revelation given to Peter. We continue to read Mark 8, 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still other one, others, one of the prophets. But who, what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus warned them. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Well, Jesus, he continues on to this region, to this place called Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi is a very beautiful place. I was there when I was in Israel. But it was also a place of pagan culture. The Romans had it as a central place where they would worship their gods. It was a very ungodly place. But um, it is in the far north of the traditional bounds of Israel. And at, at this point, Jesus wanted to speak to his disciples about his purposes for the future. But he first wanted to See his disciples be crystal clear 
about who he was. Because of the great miracles that were being performed, there were a lot of people jumping to a lot of wrong conclusions on what Jesus was up to and what he was all about. So he asked his disciples, the people who were saying, who, who do the people say that I am? And, and evidently, because he was a worker of great miracles, some were saying that he was a revisitation of a great prophet from the Old Testament, you know, Elijah. Some were saying that he was even John the Baptist, who had recently been murdered by, by King Herod. Um, then he got more specific. He says, okay, well, those people are saying this because they see the miracles that are being performed. Really, that's what they're looking at. Great miracles being wrought by Christ were similar in nature to the miracles of Elijah. So that's, that was their conclusion. But he gets personal and he says, well, well, who do you say that I am? And when the question is answered, Peter, you know, being the one the, that jumps out of the boat, being the one that speaks up, that swings the sword, you know, at the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, Peter immediately acknowledged that Jesus was more than a prophet. He acknowledged that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And Matthew has an actual eyewitness account to this event, which gives a little bit more detail on this than what Mark does. In Matthew 16, 16 to 17, Matthew writes, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. When we look at Jesus as being the Christ, we can look at all the historical evidence. We can look at all the things that he did, the miracles he accomplished, the teachings that he gave. But it is only when God reveals to us who Jesus is that we come to the truth. Because we're, we're, we're too slow. <laughs> we're too stubborn. We're too proud in our own. We need the revelation of the living God. And this is where Jesus calls us. He calls us. He beckons to us. The Holy Spirit calls out to us. When this question was asked, you know, the Lord began to explain to his disciples everything that being God's Messiah meant. And Mark 31, Mark 8, 31 to 38 reveals it. And then, after Peter exclaims this, and then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. The same Peter that was listening to the voice of the Father and had the revelation that Jesus was the Messiah, the next moment says something to Jesus and rebukes him because Jesus was saying he was going to suffer. That wasn't in the plan, Lord. That wasn't in the plan, Peter's saying to himself. Like, you're healing all these sick people and doing all these miracles, but you're up to something and I have this hunch that you are going to take the throne of David and you're going to trounce the Romans and we're going to have this whole thing going our way in this life. It's going to be the land of promise again, flowing with milk and honey, and we're going to be at the top of it. We're going to have all this creature comfort. We're going to, we're going to live with the Messiah here on the earth and have all this wonderful stuff happening here on the earth. That's what he was after. Do you see the connection? The last part of, of what I read in Mark, in, chap, in chapter 8, verse 30, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. That's why. Because all these people, including his own disciples, did not get it. They wanted to make Jesus Christ a physical king right there. And to, they had their ideas of what God was going to do in their lives. What an interesting turn of events. Peter was right on the button in saying Jesus is the Messiah. Yet he was so far off 
of what Jesus as the Messiah was all about. He had his own ideas of what the Christian life was going to be. He thought that somehow with all the miracles he was performing, Jesus was going to sway these masses of Jewish people. That was the only reason why he was doing it. And I'm sure the, the pickle in the middle of all this was that Jesus was telling them not to say anything. Was telling people that he was healing not to say anything. So what Peter didn't realize is that he was actually playing into the hands of of his enemy, Satan. In this instance, he became a well-intentioned dragon. You know, it's possible as a believer in Jesus to become a well-intentioned dragon where you can listen to a whisper. You you step out of line with the Holy Spirit and instead of listening to the voice of the Spirit, you listen to the voice of your flesh or you listen to the voice of the enemy. Even as a believer, this can happen. This is why the Bible tells us to watch our life and doctrine closely. Watch closely. And this is why we have a spiritual armor to put on that God gives us to put on. Because, my friends, we are not on neutral ground. We are in war against principalities and powers of darkness in high places. And they want nothing more than to discredit us, than to get us off track, and get us looking at the wrong things. Get us looking at wrongly what it means to have Jesus Christ as our Messiah. When Jesus turned, in verse 33 it says, and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. What were these human concerns? And I'm going to say it. The human concerns were for health, human, physical health, Wealth and prosperity in this life at the expense of the eternity of other people. Focusing in on self and self-interest in the here and now rather than focusing on serving the needs of others. The opposite of what it means to be the good Samaritan. There's a great lesson in this. Whenever you hear the whisper that follows that serving Jesus is meant to bring you health here and now, wealth here and now, and prosperity here and now. Be very careful. For there is a whisper of a serpent in your ear. No, the glory that God has planned is an eternal glory. And the kingdom that he has planned is an eternal kingdom. If he does give you health, it is so that you can serve him effectively in a place that he has called you to be. If he has given you wealth, it is so that you can be generous with your wealth for the kingdom of God because it takes takes wealth to do the things that we need to do to spread the gospel. Same with your prosperity. It's not so that you can sit there and have your little kingdom on a hill and pull in and tuck in with you and your family and and just enjoy the earth. Your prosperity is given to enable you to use the gifts that God has given you for reaching out to others that don't know the truth, that can't see their right hand from their left, that are walking in spiritual darkness. The Lord asks us to walk with him in this plan of opening the eyes of the blind. So it's not a matter of success and a kingdom being built on the earth. Those things are temporary. Matthew 6, 19 and 20 says this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And I fear, my friends, reading that scripture, there have been so many days in my life that I've had my eyes on the wrong things. You guys are in the same boat. It's human to get sidetracked. But we have not been given the spirit of this world. The spirit of this world is all about what I can make for myself and how I can be comfortable here. 
That's what it is. Look at your television. Look at the commercials. Look at everything. It's all about me building my kingdom here and now in this physical world. And what is Jesus all about? Opening the eyes of the blind so that they can see. Healing the brokenness of people that are crippled, that are dying. That's what the Good Samaritan is all about when Jesus said, love your neighbor. And what is who? The question is asked, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. That's what that's all about. You see, God gives us gifts to use for his glory. So if you've got gifts, great. Thank the Lord for them. Be thankful for them. It's okay to enjoy the fruit of your labor, but realize that the fruit of your labor is given for the sake of others. For the sake of the cross, for the sake of taking the gospel into the four corners of this world, because your life, like this week, is going to pass by like a vapor. I was talking to someone the other day about how quickly life passes. Can you believe it? We were saying, how old we are. <laughs> Can you believe it? I was talking to my wife coming, you know, the, the, the Sundays that come seem like days. They don't seem like weeks. It's like, I just was here yesterday, it feels like, you know, preaching last Sunday. My friends, this life, like a vapor, passes. You're a young person. Your life will pass very quickly. You're an old person. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about because I'm there, right? What happened to the... Young athletic man, I look in the mirror and I see a fat old man. You know, I, you know I, one day we're going to hardly be able to walk, maybe. Right? This is the progression, but it's like a snap of the fingers, it's a blink of the eye. Don't store up for yourselves treasures here on the earth because what's happening here on the earth is going to go away, it's going to flash away like the grass that grows and fades. What only matters in your life as a believer is what you do for the kingdom of God in submission to the Lord your God who has saved you and who has set you free and has called you into his service. He's called you. Every single one of you that are believers here. Not everybody has the same gift. Not everyone's going to come up here and preach. But you have different gifts. Do all for the glory of God. And when you do that, that is living abundantly. And it doesn't mean that you're going to get your Mercedes Benz and your house overlooking, you know, Canham Lake that's worth $5 million. That doesn't, that's not what it's all about. And I get tired of listening to this on Christian television and cr Christian internet where there's people flouting this. It's heresy. It is heresy. I'm going to say it again. Heresy. Run away from it. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. Romans 14, 17 says, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's not going to matter whether you're the top of the company. It's not going to ma matter if you're the world's greatest athlete. It matters very little if you go fishing to catch the biggest fish. Matters very little about not having the nicest car, about having the creature comforts. It doesn't matter. It can be taken away in a moment. Boom, gone. All gone. When you stand before the Lord, what's going to matter? Everything is going to be set ablaze. It's going to be tested. Only that which is eternal will last. That means people investing in relationships, investing in the kingdom of God. Put your energy in the right places, my friends. Because the deceiver is deceptive and he wants to lead us in the wrong direction. Now Peter, once Peter was rebuked for giving ear to the enemy, he outlines, he then turns and he outlines what it really means to be a disciple. This is all about what it really means to be a disciple. Opening of the blind eyes. Understanding that Jesus is the Messiah and properly understanding what that means in everyday living. That's what this is about, this whole chapter, the end of the chapter. 
Verse 34, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, not indulge themselves, deny themselves and take up their cross. What is a cross? Dying to self, dying to my self-interest, saying, Lord, take all of me, everything I have, everything I am. It belongs to you. Thank you for giving me this life. Lord, may I give back to you just a portion of what you give to me? And that's in every area of our lives. Whoever wants to be a disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. God, help us in those moments when we get out of touch, when we allow the scenery around us to distract us from what we're truly here for. God, forgive us. You know what I'm talking about. None of us are exempt from this.